you know, my idea of a home built was always a, a couple of boxes put together with wings on it, you know, with square corners and rectangles and things. But this is absolutely uh, not that way. It looks more like uh, a custom factory built plane. That's why I guess we like to relate it to the Ferrari. Fantastically beautiful in design. Looks like a, a high performance piece of machinery. The, the, thing, the thing that impressed me most about building the airplane is the parts all fit. Oh, well, she loves it. She can't wait to get it finished so we can do our cross country flying and go back and visit relatives and go to Arizona, Las Vegas, wherever, you know. fly as fast on the same amount of fuel. Started out home builds were for tinkerers, garage uh, mechanics that liked the idea of flying and building it themselves. That market has changed totally now. Now it's the person who doesn't want the 1940s uh, vintage production airplane. And to buy a used one, you've got the, the rotting, the rusting, the corrosion, uh, the fatigue, it's, that's all coming up now. So they're looking at other options and the kit planes are, are the prime option. Uh, 
Uh, last year, our 320 outsold any model of Beach Piper, Cessna, or Mooney. That's true. And kit planes in total outsold general aviation manufacturers in total. So the trend is there. It's, it's pretty apparent. The reasons for the success of the kit plane are it's uh, growing up in the industry, the sophistication, the performance they offer, uh, the cost savings, and the fact that you just can't get these kind of aircraft uh, in the commercial field any longer. There are the 15, say 15 to 20 thousand dollar used airplanes, but I don't look at them as serious cross country. Or, if you were to look at that as serious cross country, you have a very narrow perspective and you only need 30 seconds flying in this plane and you'll decide that you have a whole new meaning of what serious cross country is all about. Well, the whole aircraft has been, uh, from an engineering standpoint, quite an evolution. Now, uh, all of our work on the plane is all finite element analyzed uh, by one of the best composite engineers in the United States. Uh, we do extensive testing on materials. We use materials that are industry standard. Uh, we're the on only kit plane maker that I know of that uses all these type of materials. Uh, metal finishing is all mil-spec plating. It's either uh, CAD plated, uh, zinc plated, electrostatic, painted, uh, anodized. The engineering has gotten quite extensive. Uh, now whenever a question comes up on a new development, it's piped right out to our engineering department, which is uh, a separate facility, but we work very closely with. And our, I think our situation where we have an R&D and a manufacturing facility that's its own entity, and the same with engineering, has made us stronger. We're able to use the best resources that are out there and use them when we need them. And we don't have to maintain that, that overhead every day. Our system works, I think, the best for us because the engineer is the best in the country and we have him when we need him. Okay. We have our own composite shop here now, in-house, under roof. It was designed first priority was for R&D projects. Uh, we like to work on a fast timeline and having an R&D shop uh, with composite uh, fabrication capabilities under our roof was a, was a big, big advantage. High Tech Composites is in the United States here. They manufacture for us. They do some R&D work for us. We also have an offshore company in the Philippines that manufactures and does a lot of material testing for us. And we have another company who's a manufacturing distributor in Australia, and they do the same. They'll do R&D, and it's a production backup. We don't buy from them normally, but we could. We have uh, full sets of molds at all locations. I think one of the nice things about our program uh, that we've developed with High Tech Composites, they are uh, a recognized manufacturer of uh, FAA STC parts, uh, supplemental type certificate. That means that the quality assurance programs that they have to enforce in order to meet the FAA standards of tra materials traceability, uh, handling proper layup schedules, total QC, that whole system is up and running and they use the same system when they manufacture our parts, so we know we're getting the best parts. It's also one of the reasons that we use all high temperature prepregs. Again, it's a quality assurance. One of the reasons why industry uses all high temperature epoxies. The, uh, for example, the prepreg on our materials, we know we have uh, certs from Hexel and Sibagaygi where we get them, and the resin content, for example, will be 39% uh, plus or minus 2%. That's guaranteed, that's documented, that's tested every batch run. The type of materials we have in this plane are very sophisticated materials carbon fiber, uh, prepreg epoxies, um, honeycomb, makes a big difference. One of the other big, big advantages of our material uh, selection and, and fabrication is that the fuselage, for example, is fire resistant. Most composites are not fire resistant. Obviously, the FAA requires that, and among other things, that's what we use. The uh, prepreg won't sustain a flame, and the honeycomb and the fuselage will not sustain a flame. 
a reasonable advantage. You build an airplane, you get a one-time repairment certificate, allows you to do annuals on your airplane, your airplane only, and that, that saves you a lot of money every year. An annual is not difficult. Uh, the rationale for doing your own annual is since you built the airplane, nobody knows that airframe better than you, and that gives you the authority to do the annual, and there's logic behind it, I think. This is a good example to illustrate the double joggle system that we use on the plane. I think this double joggle system is probably one of the single most things that makes this plane assemble, I think, easier than anything else on the market. Um, if you can get in close, you can see this. There's a, every part has a, a single and a, and a double joggle. You'll see that the, this piece, which is representative of the tail cone, and this is the vertical fin that would uh, plug into it. They, it's a matched overlap joint. This piece drops into it. In doing so, it gives you an alignment. It essentially is a pre-alignment for you. Then we use a structural adhesive underneath, and we've stepped this back so it can illustrate a little bit better. We use pop rivets as a clamping fixture. They're later drilled out. The structural adhesive is the primary bond, and into this single channel that's remaining are two wet, uh, what we call bid tapes. Two wet tapes are laid in there. That brings you up flush to surface. It's a real simple uh, uh, micro finish, and you, you're done. Our parts are unique in that uh, with the prepregs, we don't use a gel coat or a gel coat primer. Uh, those, those materials are really nothing more than resin with an uh, opaque pigment in them. They're very, very heavy. So we stay away from it, again, as industry does. We recommend that they use an epoxy-based primer. It's sprayed on, typically uh, two applications. You sand it and you paint it. It's pretty simple. Wings are detachable on the plane. That's a big advantage. Uh, we forget about that sometimes and not really try to uh, promote it as we should because most people don't assume that. But it's true. They're, it's about a 45 minute affair to take the wings off. The plane stays completely on the landing gear. You can start it up and taxi it around if you like. You know, the fact that our plane has removable wings makes it an easy plane to build at home. You can jig the wing up onto the airplane and then take it back off again and continue building. Yeah, the, the gear is all custom. We get asked about that a lot. The gear is custom to this airplane. It's a very simple gear system. It's electromechanical, uh, operates by hydraulics. If, if the hydraulic power pack should quit, you can free fall it down. If you run out of uh, hydraulic pressure, it'll come down and lock by itself. Simple system. Many people ask us about engines. What engines are the best to use? Uh, should I buy a new engine, used engine? Uh, we now have an OEM dealership arrangement with Lycoming, and we offer, among other things, factory new Lycoming engines. 160 horse, 180 horse. We offer uh, brand new Hartzell propellers, uh, Narco avionics, uh, autopilots, you name it. We've just about got everything on the airplane that you could ever considerably, uh, conceivably want. I have found that the um, Lance Air Corporation has been just fantastic. Um, they have, have uh, answered questions. They have, uh, uh, there's one or two small changes they made. They supplied the parts at no cost. But even from the beginning, why, geez, anything you wanted, uh, advice or pieces or anything, you couldn't ask for any better support. No, I would rate them as, as being first class. I don't think there's another kit manufacturer that's as good as they are. You know, they've all become uh, good friends of mine. Builder support's a big issue. It's, uh, uh, you know, we try to uh, cover the bases as best we can in the manual, but there's always things that come up. Uh, we have one of the best technical staffs around. When we sell an airplane to somebody, uh, it's not a pat on the back and goodbye. It's uh, really a handshake and hello. And we know we'll be dealing with them for uh, the time it takes to get their airplane done. And that's fine. That's, that's what we're here for. 
time is a giant spread. We've had builders complete an airplane in 1,000 to 1,100 hours. I have to say that's probably pretty rare. We've had builders uh, flying in the 2,000 hour range. So the one year we made a poll at Oshkosh of the eight planes that flew in and it averaged 1,600 hours. So we use that as a number and, and it's a reasonable number for someone with uh, nothing particular as far as skills. We, we try to build an airframe that doesn't require special talents or special tools to build. And we now have what we call a fast build kit. Uh, we're building right to the limit of 51%. And the balance has to be built, or that 51% has to be uh, built by the owner. We're right there. What the fast build does is eliminate about uh, six to 700 hours off your building time. That's a sizable chunk. Had the uh, fast build kit been available when I purchased this, I'm sure I would have gone for that. The standard airframe has 41 pieces to it for the exterior surfaces. In the fast build option, we take those 41, do major, major sub-assemblies on them, and it ends up being about six giant pieces now that, in some cases, just bolt together. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a pretty impressive affair. This is an outboard wing panel for the 320. It's the fast build version. This is just the way it comes to you. Uh, the main spar is pre-molded. It's bonded in position to the wing skin, which uh, we're looking at it upside down. So we're seeing what is the two fuel bays. Uh, the ribs form it, the ribs are installed, the back spar web is installed. Uh, it's been pre-aligned to the center section and that's been pre-aligned to the fuselage. So it's, uh, you can see where a lot of the hours are gone. This is a section of the horizontal stabilizer. This is actually the top. And it has the two webs, uh, all the ribs, and they're again bonded in. And the bottom is aligned as far as uh, flatness and trueness. The elevator is done the same way. The rudder is done the same way. Ailerons are done the same way. Flaps we don't address because of the logistics of how the plane goes together. This is the 320 wing as it comes in the fast build kit. It's comprised of three major sub-assemblies, the two outboard wing sections and the center section. They've been attached here to illustrate a little more clearly. The wing ribs are all installed, the back spar, the front spar, the wing skins. Closeout webs are installed. Uh, all the wing attached hardware is in. Lines for electricals installed in the D section. Belly pan is attached. Wing fuel is uh, converted out of these bays. This has all been attached and pre-aligned once to the fuselage, and I think it represents uh, a big, big savings in man hours, and this is virtually how you get it. If somebody were really working fast, they could probably open their crate, put this thing together to the point where the fast build looked like a nearly finished airplane, and they could do it in probably 15 seconds. One thing we've been doing that's going over very well with the builders uh, that are finished their airplanes, they ask, uh, now what do I do about test flying this plane? We have an in-house test pilot that has inspected and test flown many airplanes for customers. We've sent them all over the world already. We have an independent test pilot who does the same thing. Uh, the way we operate, it's on a shared expense basis. We don't make a profit on this, we just want our expenses covered, and it ends up being very beneficial for the, for the uh, pilot. Another option is for the builder to come here, check out with us in our company plane, and get some stick time and feel pretty comfortable before he goes back and test flies his own aircraft. That's been a very effective program too. This airplane is, is very stable. You can put it in any attitude and it'll stay there, but it takes almost no force to, uh, to get it to respond. 
Roll rate's uh, spectacular. It's uh, about, we publish 120, we've demonstrated 140 degrees per second. As a roll rate, uh, like most aerobatic aircraft, does very nice rolls. It's uh, differential ailerons, so you can do rolls, you can uh, do essentially all your flying. I've gotten to be very lazy on the rudder because you don't use the rudder in the air. Some people just don't believe it but um, until they fly it, but you just don't use the rudder in the air. Uh, the dampening on it is positive in all, all respects. It's uh, a three-fingered airplane. You fly with uh, a thumb and two fingers, and that's it. We have a long tail moment on it. Uh, it makes for a stable platform, relatively speaking, although it's still a light touch. Well, the performance on this airplane is uh, nothing short of phenomenal, really. Uh, this particular one has 160 horse Lycoming in it. Uh, that's the same engine that's in the Cessna 172. Uh, I haven't flown those planes in so long. I don't know how slow they are, but I do recall they're quite slow on a relative scale. This plane tops out at about 255. Uh, and of course, we're burning the same fuel because we're running the same engine. So. Uh, we're close to doubling the speed. In fact, I think we're a little more than doubling the speed from the uh, Cessna that it came out of. It'll go from point A to point B rapidly, or you can just go out and fly around the pattern and have a ball. It doesn't burn that much gas. Usually, if you have an airplane that is a good cross-country airplane, you, you wouldn't go out Sunday morning and shoot touch and goes because it's phenomenally expensive to go fast, where this airplane will do both. You can go out and do some mild aerobatics, you can fly it around the pattern, or you can a four or five hundred mile trip. Uh, one of the things we're also doing is installing a 180 horse engine into this plane. With the 180, we have one flying. With the 180 horsepower, we're seeing speeds of a little over 265 miles an hour. And the climb rates are up about three to four hundred feet a minute in addition to what we see with this plane. So we're getting into some real spectacular numbers for cross country flying. The climb rate on the plane is about 2,400 feet a minute solo, and at gross weight, it's about 1,600 feet per minute. Well, when you're cruising cross-country in this plane, uh, and our Loran will point that right out to us because it'll, we have an interface with our fuel flow meter, it'll give us our miles per gallon, and we'll see about 30 miles per gallon. Better than a Volkswagen, and we're cruising at 240 miles an hour. Range is real good on this aircraft. We flew loaded down out of here, uh, Los Angeles nonstop to Aspen. That was uh, three hours and 15 minutes, I believe. When we landed in Aspen, we had enough fuel. We could have flown halfway back to LA again. So uh, it makes for a nice cross-country business plane. The cockpit area on this plane, the 320, is 42 inches wide. Production airplanes come in anywhere from uh, 39, typically, to about 41. I think the Mooney is about 40, and the Bonanza is about 42, the same as ours. I rattle around inside it. There's plenty of room for me, and, and I'm not used to that. <laughs> it's, it's quite nice. We fly with sticks in this plane. It feels natural. Um, you put your hand on the armrest, and you lay your hand where it wants to go, and the stick is there. It's, uh, it's real comfortable. When you're sitting in the airplane, everything's well within reach, but you don't feel cramped or crowded at all. It's, it's kind of like a nice, familiar recliner chair. You know, you just fit, sit there and very comfortable. Unlike some airplanes, some kit planes, uh, that have a big wing carry-through that you're actually uh, cradled over top the wing and your feet are up on top of it, ours is not so. You, you've got a nice footwell that you can kind of move your feet around in. Makes flying a lot more comfortable. And once you've had the visibility, uh, you don't want to give it up. You can roll into a, into a 90 degree bank turn and just look here, and that's, you see it, you see where you're going. I mean, it's, that's one of the big, big comments. We always get the spectacular visibility in it. With the 320, you're able to see very well over the nose. There's no visibility problems. Very short rollout, there's little inertia so it stops real easy. Um, 
just a real easy airplane to fly. We get asked often about insurance, and no, insurance is not an issue. Uh, one of the larger insurance companies in the country, uh, they're well affiliated with the Experimental Aircraft Association, and uh, they have an, an official rating for Lancers now. There are enough in the air, and it's a, a rate that's just about uh, on a par with a Mooney. So any insurance you want is, uh, is really not an issue. It's relatively inexpensive. A person looking for an aircraft today has got, uh, you might say, three choices if he's looking for something that's got some reasonable cross-country potential. Uh, he can buy a new aircraft, uh, any of the production planes that are, aren't too many of them being built anymore, but of the ones that are. I flew in a new one uh, out of Oshkosh last year. It was a brand new one, hadn't been delivered yet. It was $375,000. That's not a reasonable choice for a lot of people. They look at the used planes, they're in the fifty to a hundred thousand dollar range. And while they may be a reasonable alternative, often cases when you buy the plane it's just admission to the club and the bills start rolling in from that point on every annual. The other option is to buy a kit plane. Uh, you get the performance that you can't match with a production plane and, and you'll build the plane for its it's conceivable to build this plane for thirty-five or forty thousand dollars. Most people won't. They'll put more into it because it becomes a relatively serious airplane that will take serious trips. So we've got uh, people with thirty, forty thousand dollars on the instrument panel with weather radar and uh, slaved HSIs and <laughs> you name it. They've got it on it. But to get a kind of an all-round average number, it might be uh, forty-five thousand dollars to finish an airplane and a little bit of your time. The reason for the delay on the four place was really personal. Uh, I was a, a two-person and three-person family man, and now I'm a four-person family man, and, and uh, that's the need for it. Uh, it goes into the marketing side, too, of course. I think the production plane market was strong enough in the years back that uh, the value of a four-place kit plane uh, wasn't quite as strong. Now, with the uh, the fleet age of the production planes being 25 years. Um, they're rotting, they're rusting, they're corroding, they're fatiguing. Uh, I think a four-place kit plane makes a lot more sense these days. And the support we've seen on the, on the product is, I think, justified that. The primary purpose of the four-place uh, was really speed, speed and comfort. Um, the production airplane market, again, while it's uh, continuing to decline, still can produce a reasonably priced uh, used airplane that's in the 200 mile an hour range. Therefore, I wanted to do something that was totally unique. Uh, that's where our two places are, that's where the four place had to be, and that's speed. So we really set our aim at 300 miles an hour or faster, and, uh, and we've actually exceeded that uh, beyond what uh, our engineering uh, said we would get, so we're happy about that, but it's a different machine. It operates in the flight levels, it operates in the uh, 300 knot range, not even 300 miles an hour. We're, we've seen 340 miles an hour with the plane. Uh, that can't be had in any other uh, production airplane. Cabin area is large. Typically people think that you suffer with a uh, home build or a kit plane because it'll, it won't have the creature comforts you're used to. This plane has to have them. Uh, again, to appeal to the market that would otherwise be buying that production plane. So it's a very large cabin. It measures 46 inches across on the inside at the elbows. Uh, the back seat measures 43. That's larger than most of the front seats in production planes. Headroom has never been an issue. Uh, another feature that I think is becoming increasingly popular, we see it in the commercial planes, some of the military, but we have dual side stick controls in the plane. Uh, that gives a totally new sense of freedom to the front cabin area of the craft. Uh, the control sticks are out of the way. You can open charts and speeds we're going. We're flying through charts pretty fast. So uh, it's an advantage that uh, we really didn't appreciate until, until we were up flying. And now we see that 
all that freedom and all that accessibility and the ability to move around in the plane and not bump controls is something that uh, is a real refreshing delight. We recently set a world speed record. It's a NAA official speed record now. Our test pilot set it from uh, San Francisco to Denver at 24,000 feet, 362.4 miles per hour. Um, that's, I think, a pretty valid statement of uh, where this plane can get you across this country and how fast you can get there. This plane is turbocharged. It was designed to be turbocharged. It doesn't have to be, but uh, the big advantage there, of course, is the altitude. Uh, it's a large airframe, so it does better at higher altitudes. It's not a sea level rat racer like uh, some of the other planes are. It's a get up high and go plane. Interestingly enough, we've had customers that are building this airplane or about to. They say, well, I only fly in the 12,000 foot range anyway. And our comment to them is, is that because you choose to or is it because your airplane won't climb any higher? Uh, this plane is just starting to smile as it passes through 12,000 feet and is typically passing through it at about 2,000 feet a minute still. Uh, at 20,000 feet, it's happy as a clam, and its service ceiling is really limited by the oxygen requirement, not the ability of the airframe. So we find that we fly the airplane with the weather in mind. We can overfly 90% of the weather if that's what we choose to do. We can fly high to gain the tailwinds. We can fly low to avoid them and it's really uh, pilot discretion rather than airframe uh, control. And so, again, it's a refreshing freedom. The slow end is always an issue. People think a plane that goes this fast has got to be an absolute bullet to try to get around the, the traffic pattern. Uh, in reality, this plane flies the traffic pattern at almost identical speeds to our two place. Uh, it's a little faster than a Cessna 182, but not much different than a 210. Uh, we'll fly the pattern at, um, oh, anywhere from uh, 110 down to 90 and on a downwind. And uh, the old term of coming over the fence, well, we usually come over the fence about 80 miles an hour. Uh, it'll touch down about 70 to 75. 75 is more comfortable just from an attitude of visibility. The reason that we have this good low end performance is due almost entirely to the Fowler flaps. Again, they're a, a fairly sophisticated uh, item on an airplane that you see in the, in the large jets, you'll see it in the corporate fleet. You very rarely see it in the commercial aviation uh, fleet, and you almost never see it in the, in the home builder kit plane uh, fleet. But uh, this plane had to have that in order to get that low end performance. They're full slotted, electrically operated Fowler flaps, about half span make a big, big difference. The landing gear is relatively unique on this aircraft. Again, it has to do with the high altitude capability and the slow end capability. That meant that the wing had to function extremely effectively for us if we were going to meet those two goals. To do that, we had to get the landing gear out of the wing. It just There was no place for it there. We put the landing gear into the fuselage and it retracts hydraulically and rack and pinions back into the fuselage. Uh, the gear never talks to the wing and that's a beautiful relationship. As far as rough field performance, uh, it's, a, it's a real stout gear. It's a tubular 4340 steel gear, uh, very similar in concept, although uh, totally unique, but similar in concept to the Cessna 210. It has a 606 uh, main gear and a 505 nose gear, oleo strut on the nose, and it should handle any rough field that's, you know, it's not a, a bush plane, but it, it'll handle rough fields. The materials are very unique on this airplane. Again, they're not unique to the aerospace industry, but they are to general aviation. This aircraft has a mission in that in order to gain this high speed, we needed a light airframe. We needed a light airframe because we don't have a large wing. In order to get that light airframe, uh, we basically had to go to carbon fiber. It's a rather expensive and still a somewhat exotic material that's beginning to make some introduction into the high-end general aviation to the turboprop uh, fleets and so forth. 
the Beach Starship and the new Piaggio Avanti and so forth, they're using carbon fiber. And of course the military has been using it exclusively for years and years. This plane is built almost entirely of carbon fiber, but the weight savings are, are astronomical. The prepreg uh, carbon is about 30, 32% lighter than the prepreg e-glass that we normally would use. And that e-glass is about 25 to 45% lighter than a wet layup e-glass. So the difference between a wet layup uh, airplane and a carbon fiber prepreg airplane is day and night. Actually, our Lancer 4 will be the second successful uh, composite carbon fiber airplane ever to be pressurized. Now, some will say, well, the Learfan would be number two, Starship is number one. Learfan really never met their objective. Uh, we have met ours. The Lancer 4 now, we've uh, built the cabin section, we've cycle tested it. Uh, it's, it's holding up just fine. We operate at five PSI differential, which is quite large, actually. What that equates to, is at 24,000 feet cruising, we'll have a cabin altitude of 8,500 feet, very comfortable. The finished cost of a plane uh, like the Lance Air 4 is like any home-built airplane or kit plane. You know, it's a big spread depending on a few key variables, namely the engine and avionics. However, uh, for ballpark numbers, it's probably safe to assume 60, 65,000 as a minimum $100,000 would uh, get you a finished airplane, no question about it. And of course, you can put a lot more in if you like. What you're comparing that to, if you use the, even the high number, you use the $100,000 figure, what you're comparing that to is, is the, uh, the Mooney, the Bonanza. Uh, those planes are $250,000 to $350,000. This plane is about 150 miles an hour faster, and you've got a brand new airplane. The drumbeat out there seemed to indicate a need for an airplane that's uh, oh, somewhere between our two-place airplane and our four-place rocket ship. Um, you know, as we said before, we're no longer selling to just the tinkerers, the, uh, the garage mechanics. Our, our customer base now is uh, really looking to us for the airplane of choice for a flight into the 21st century. The plane that uh, we've developed here, the ES, fits that niche between the two airplanes. It's a four-place airplane, it's an easy-to-fly airplane, and of course with all our airplanes it has to meet two things. It has to be stylish and it has to be fast, and we've, we've met those goals as well. The first reaction we got when we introduced the plane at Oshkosh was that the, this was really a Lance Air 4 with the gear down and welded. The only real similarities are the fact that the fuselage is built from the same molds. Materials are different, that's a cost factor because this plane is designed to be a much more economical plane, both to fly and to operate and maintain and to build. The differences between this plane and the four, once you leave the fuselage, nothing is the same. We have a, a different wing, it's a much larger wing, similar airfoil sections, but plan form of the wing is totally different. Uh, where the four is 98 square feet, this one is 140 square feet. Instead of a complex Fowler flap, we have a very simple slotted flap equally effective, much easier to build. Where the tail on the two place is 20 square feet, we have 30 square feet on this tail, it's 50% larger. And up front, even though it's the same cowling, in, in essence, uh, the horsepower is quite a bit different. We have 200 horsepower in this plane, normally aspirated. So it's, the whole idea of the plane is to produce a very simple, economical, yet fast airplane. Performance numbers are, I think, pretty spectacular. That's true with, I believe, all of our airplanes. Now, a nice way to put it is that this airplane will cruise at speeds comparable to a new Bonanza. Uh, the fuel burn, uh, it sips fuel uh, closer to that of a Cherokee 140. And as far as useful load, it's huge. It's, it's uh, besides having a huge cabin, there's a lot of stuff you can put in it. It's, it's like the old saying, if you can get it through the door, you can fly it. And that's generally true with this airplane. We have a useful load of 1,200 pounds with a 1,300-mile range uh, that still leaves 770-some pounds of payload. If you want to drop down to a 1,000-mile range, which is comparable to most of the uh, production airplanes, in fact, it's quite a bit more, 
uh, that'll increase your payload by another 75, 85 pounds. So uh, it, it's really a hauler if you want to use it for that. We have in this airplane, along with our Lance Air 4, probably one of the best known, uh, proven aviation engines on the market right now. That's what they call a lean burn engine. Typically, you'll lean an engine back until it starts running rough, and then the old saying is you give it two clicks for the family and run a little bit richer. Uh, with these engines, they run so smooth, it's cross-flow heads with tuned induction. And the 550 Continental and this engine, which is the 360 ES Continental, are the two unique engines uh, that offer this lean burn uh, capability. And at 192 miles an hour cruising, we're down to about an 8.3, 8.4 gallon per hour burn at, uh, call it conventional altitudes, 10, 12, 13,000. If you want to go higher, uh, the speed doesn't drop off much at all, but the fuel burn will go down substantially. With a plane that cruises at uh, close to 200, we're in the, well, as we say, the 190 to 195 range typically, the large flaps offer one big advantage, and the stall speed is down to 54 miles an hour. So the approaches are, are slow and easy, and, and uh, runway usage is minimal. Again, it's the, whole, the whole intent of this airplane is to make for a, a utility airplane that's fun to fly, very economical, and easy to fly as well as easy to build. The landing gear is, is unique for, uh, for any of my designs. I've always built retractable airplanes, and, and uh, the simplicity of this landing gear actually astounded me. I didn't realize how many things are, one must build into an airplane to make the gear go up and down. Uh, so this has been a, a real refreshing experience to build a fixed gear airplane. Another thing about this plane, Again, to emphasize the utility of it, it has to be a rugged gear. Uh, we have 606 main gear tires on it. Those are large. Uh, it's a very stout main gear. It takes a good pounding, and it'll still make you look like a hero. The nose strut is an oleo strut. That's a more expensive variety than some of the planes you'll see out there with a spring tube nose strut. Uh, however, it's a far superior one. It dampens out the, the um, shall we say, the less perfect landings. And again, uh, you'll go away smiling from it. Another thing about our airplanes, all of our airplanes, is that we have to design them for the home builder in mind, which means he's going to be putting this thing together in his garage. That, uh, that's an easy job to do with removable wings. All of our airplanes have that, and the ES uh, follows that tradition. The wings can be taken off. Uh, the plane will stay totally on the landing gear, and you can actually pull it around at trailers very nicely on a, on a trailer. You can build each wing separately, the left wing and the right wing. They don't have to be joined. We do that at the factory here as far as all the attached bushings. They're set before it goes out. So the first time you have to really put the wings together is when you're mating them to the fuselage. At that point in time, you'll probably have to roll it out into the driveway, and uh, it'll be out there for an afternoon as you do that mate up. But then you can take them off and bring it back inside. We have a lot of customers that fly, uh, well, uh, for example, in Europe, there's a lot of customers that are flying in Europe with our aircraft, and even with the two-place and, and uh, the four, they have to operate out of grass strips, uh, sometimes gravel strips. In Mexico, we have customers down there, and they're on typically gravel, not grass. So all of our planes have been evolving uh, to a status where they'll handle that adequately. We've developed... Uh, a 505 main gear for their, our two-place designs, the 320 and the 360. And with the four, uh, it's the same uh, real stout 606 gear. And with the ES, that was one of the prime objectives, too, to maintain that. So uh, it does very nicely on grass and gravel. Most airplanes that are tightly cowled, and most of ours are, will have cowl flaps. It's another procedure, another cockpit chore duty, if you will, that you must watch. Uh, we've tried to design these airplanes so that we don't need cowl flaps, and uh, I'm happy to say we've been successful at that. So uh, the ES, the four, and the three, all of our airplanes, for that matter, uh, typically do not use cowl flaps. The cabin on the ES is, uh, since the plane is built from the same molds as the Lance Air 4, the cabin is the same size. The interior of it is actually very similar. It's a 46-inch wide cabin. 
It's 40, almost 48 inches tall. Uh, you sit upright in it. You have adjustable front seats. The back seats are forward facing. And with the ES, the baggage area is absolutely huge. But since we started with our two place designs, with a bubble canopy, the visibility issue has always been prime. We've been astounded by, the, by their customers that fly the plane or prospective customers and they'll ride in it and just go nuts over the, the, over the tremendous visibility. Uh, our four place designs, both the Lance Air 4 and the new ES, also capture that even though there is a more of a uh, cabin feel to the airplane. Uh, it has a lot of window space and, and we get that same comment uh, as customers fly this compared to a Oh, uh, Bonanza, Mooney, or, or Air Special, or any of those production airplanes, that visibility is just far superior in these planes. When you fly the airplane, it, it just feels, uh, it just feels right. It feels uh, like it has no, uh, it's not going to do anything bad to you, and it's just, I think the airplane's enjoying flying as much as you are flying. Basically, it looks good and is fast. Yeah, it's a beautiful plane. I've had a lot of fun with the whole thing. There hasn't been a, hasn't been a negative part to it anywhere. You know, I would advise anybody to do it. All comes in a box, you put it together, you go fly.